Great, Craig. Thanks. So Tom Graves is a real professional with experience in a variety of photographic areas, including corporate, industrial, photojournalism, portraits, and travel. His clients include 3M, AT&T, Cisco Systems, Merrill Lynch, Pfizer, and the list goes on. Tom is one of a lucky few who have studied po portrait photography in New York with Philip Halsman, creator of over 100 Life magazine covers. We were actually lucky to have Tom speak and exhibit his book, Twice Heroes, America's Nisei Veterans of World War II in Korea at the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Let's please give a big Golden Gate Breakfast Club welcome to Tom Graves. Tom, take it away. Go. Oh, thanks everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I, tuned, I tuned in to watch uh, Michael's presentation on Japantown. That's really what uh, drew me to your group. I was not disappointed. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted that Michael was able to introduce me this morning. Unmute Tom. Tom, they muted you. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. You guys missed the best joke of the morning. <laughs> I was saying how delighted I was to, um, to tune in a couple of weeks ago to meet your group and to hear Michael speak about Japantown, which is a subject close to my heart. And it's terrific <laughs> just to hear you all introduced and... Um, you know, your various skills and positions in the Bay Area. It's a real treat uh, to be here. It's kind of like a big breakfast table with a lot of uh, friends and new friends. So um, as, as San Franciscans, I know many of you, uh, most of you know the name Joe Rosenthal and many of you have met Joe Rosenthal. And um, he, of course, is the photographer who took the famous Iwo Jima flag raising photograph. And we're gonna talk about that a bit as well. So let me, um, Antonio walked me through uh, screen sharing and things yesterday. Let's see what a good job I can do. Hang on just a sec. Okay, let's see if I can do this right. Okay, almost got it right. You know, this worked uh, this morning, Antonio. I apologize. It's completely fine. You can even run with that. That's not a problem. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm pushing the right buttons, but uh, it's not letting me. So let's do this. This way actually helps me a little bit too. Uh, for those of you who met Joe, who passed away in 2006, you probably met him uh, looking something like this. This photo was taken about 1990 and um, he had already been retired from the San Francisco Chronicle uh, as their chief photographer for um, a few years. Joe was born in Washington, D.C. in 1911, I believe, and at the age of 19, he followed his older brother to San Francisco, and his brother helped him get a job at one of the at that time, several daily newspapers. And um, Joe was a kid, he ran around, he was a gopher uh, kind of position and soon got involved with the photography department, first again as a helper, then finally as a photographer. And that became his career for the next uh, several decades. First with the San Francisco newspapers, uh, the Chronicle, then the Associated Press during World War II, and then back to the Chronicle after the war for uh, another 30 years or more. This, however, is what Joe looked like 
if you were there with him on February 23rd, 1945. And um, at this time, Joe was 33. Uh, he was uh, on Iwo Jima with the Marines. This was the fifth day of the Iwo Jima battle. And uh, Joe is standing on top of Mount Suribachi where he took his famous photo. You can see he's holding his big uh, four by five press camera with both hands, because um, it was big, weighed five or six pounds. Hey, Tom. Yes, sir. Your presentation isn't showing. I don't believe, is anybody seeing it? Oh, my. I'm seeing it. Oh <laughs> yeah, it's, it says yeah. I'm sharing. Oh, okay. Of course, we can see it. I can see it. Okay. I can see it. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. never mind. Sorry about that. Good. Is that a crown, a crown graphics he's holding also? Uh, that's right. Wow. Um, the, the couple of things about this photo, which you may not see straight off, are um, one, uh, Joe's wearing glasses, and he wore very thick glasses. And when actually was he was turned down uh, when he tried to enlist in the Army after the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, which is terribly ironic because he went on to become, um, take the most great, the, the greatest photo, I believe, of all time. A man with very poor eyesight. Secondly, uh, if you can see, there are a number of ships uh, at sea behind Joe, and that's a portion of the American invasion fleet of Iwo Jima. There were uh, several hundred ships at or around the island to support the 70,000 Marines that went ashore. And uh, the total number of ships supporting that operation was over 800. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about Iwo Jima and then uh, Joe's gonna come back in the picture. Here's a map of the Great Pacific. Um, you can see continental US on the right side. Somewhere in the middle is Hawaii and holy smoke, what is the rest of this? There are more islands out there than you could see on this small map or even if it was um, quite a bit bigger. And of course, this was the, the Pacific battleground of World War II. There were the Caroline Islands, the Solomons, the Gilberts, uh, the Marianas, each of these island groups had, had dozens or more uh, islands. And if you can see my cursor, um, here is the, the Japanese uh, main home islands. And right here are the volcano islands. And that's where Iwo Jima, uh, where Iwo Jima is. It's 700 some miles from Tokyo. Iwo Jima invasion was the first time in the long Pacific War that the US actually invaded Japanese territory. Before that, all the islands, all the battles we were in, we were reclaiming territories that Japan had occupied. The Iwo Jima was the first Japanese territory uh, where we fought in World War II. And this was a World War II era uh, aerial photograph of the island. Um, and I'll point out a, a couple of key features. Uh, uh, bottom right, uh, a little hard to see, but this is Mount Suribachi, highest point on the island, about 555 feet. Uh, this practically up and down straight line on the right are were the main invasion beaches the Marines used. In the center of the island is uh, uh, airfield number one. Uh, behind it, harder to see, is airfield number two. And behind that, there was a third airfield uh, under construction. And those airfields were the uh, objectives of the Marines. If, if uh, we controlled those airfields, um, we were in a much better strategic position for um, the future of the war. I'm going fast and skipping ahead because uh, 
I could talk about this all day and you guys don't want that. Here is a little chart of the island. Again, Mount Suribachi, the bottom left, the invasion beaches, uh, airfield number one, airfield number two, and airfield number three. And on the left side of the island are what were termed the secondary invasion beaches. The narrowest part of the island right here is only several hundred yards. Um, the island is about four miles long. It's a total of uh, eight square miles of, uh, of territory. It's a volcanic island, uh, very rocky, sandy. Um, there's no fresh water source on the island. It's very inhospitable. The only thing that was there before World War II was a um, sulfur quarry. And Iwo Jima means sulfur island in uh, Japanese. Uh, this man in early 1944, uh, General Tadamichi Kobayashi uh, became the commandant of the Japanese defenses on Iwo Jima. And um, he was quite a brilliant man and a brilliant commander. He had uh, attended classes at Harvard. He taught himself English. Uh, he bought a car, drove himself around the United States uh, before World War II, of course. And he had a sense of America and the, the, the size and strength of America and he knew that the Japanese were in trouble. But he was also a samurai and he was dedicated to uh, do his job. And when he was sent to Iwo Jima, he knew it was a suicide mission. He would not be coming home. I'd like to tell you more about him, but we have to move on. Um, here's the 28th Marines. Uh, in the first waves of their invasion of the uh, Iwo Jima. Now you can see clearly Mount Suribachi on the top left, that straight line of the invasion beaches. And uh, invasion date was February 19th, 1945. The Marines no sooner got off their uh, landing craft than they encountered these three about 15 foot high um, sandy terraces that um, really slowed things down. The, the, the coarse volcanic sand was more like running in a pile of uh, 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 corn or wheat or something like that. You, there was no way to get traction under your feet. The, the sand merely pushed to the side and no matter how hard you struggled. So, you see the Marines at the top have managed to crawl their way up to the top of, this is the first uh, uh, a 15 foot high berm. There's two more. And when the Marine uh, vehicles, uh, Jeeps, tanks, uh, et cetera, started to come ashore, they could not drive up these terraces. They had to wait for the CBs to land bulldozers and actually plow roads out of this um, out of these terraces. This was part of um, General Korobayashi's strategy was to let the Marines and their supplies and vehicles pile up on the beaches like this, uh, where they would become prime targets for his artillery. We'll zoom ahead now to the fifth day of the battle. Uh, this is the uh, first flag that was raised on uh, Mount Suribachi in the morning of February 23rd. And uh, the, the flag raising and Joe's photo ha have spawned more rumors and misinformation for the last 76 years than I think any single um, other piece of history. Um, this was the first flag it went up about 10 in the morning on February 23rd. Um, you can see a couple things from this picture. One is that's a pretty small flag up there. That becomes important in a moment. 
Secondly, here's a young Marine in the foreground with his uh, carbine and very much on alert. Uh, this was enemy held territory. And uh, these Marines uh, scaled the mountain, put up the flag and actually came under enemy fire on their way down the mountain. But this was not a, this was a war zone. These guys were very much familiar with it. If you can see the, the figure, you can only see his back and what looks like a radio on his back. And that was um, San Franciscan uh, Ray Jacobs, who worked at um, KQED for a number of years and um, told people he was one of the flag raisers on Iwo Jima. And um, in fact, he was a part of the first flag raising team. There's no photo of the first flag going up, which is kind of interesting. Here, however, is a photo of the first flag coming down and the second larger flag being raised uh, by what would become the six famous Marines who we'll see in a moment. And here is uh, Rosenthal's uh, famous picture of the six Marines raising the flag. Um, I, th I think it's one of the most extraordinary photographs in history. It certainly accomplished more, I think, than any other photograph in history. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Interesting about this photo is uh, there's six men here. It, first glance, it looks like four. Then you can sort of see there's a fifth person, but in fact, there's six uh, Marines in this photo. You can also see less well, again, the view out to sea. And um, you can tell it from this vantage point, Japanese artillery observers could call in fire on any ship at sea, any Marine or vehicle they saw uh, on the island. As soon as Joe, or a few minutes rather, after Joe took this famous picture, um, this is what he was doing. He was photographing the Marines who raised the flag and a few others who were up there and got them together as uh, you know, we all do at events, got them all together looking at the camera and he took this photograph, which also became uh, pretty well known. So why, why do I call this photo um, the most important photo perhaps ever made? Well, at, the, at this point of the war, um, the US was going broke. We were paying for our war efforts we were supporting Britain, we were supporting uh, Russia, and um, somebody had to pay for all this. And the um, war was not being paid for by our income tax dollars uh, in an unusual arrangement. It was being paid for by war bonds that the American people bought. So Joe's photo uh, taken in February quickly became the symbol of the seventh war loan drive. And this drive um, was highly, highly successful and, and raised money that had been lacking in the last two um, uh, war bond drives. It raised uh, uh, over $200 billion in, in, world, in 1945 money uh, for the war effort. So it, it truly saved the US from going bankrupt. More than that, the, the spirit and the power contained in this photograph really raised the spirits of the people at home, of the families who were losing young men overseas, of the millions of people working in the war industries. And it really gave us uh, as a nation a boost. And, and at the time, people were getting tired of the war. We, ha we had no sooner thought that the war was about to end when December 44 and January 45, the Battle of the Bulge um, 
was a terrible battle in Europe, over 100,000 American casualties and things were suddenly uh, looking bleak. This photo changed all that. There's a number of firsts associated with Joe's photo. Um, one of them is uh, the first time, only time the Pulitzer Prize has been awarded the same year the photograph was taken. It's typically awarded the, the following year. They made that exception because of such an extraordinary photo. Here's a US postage stamp that was rushed into production based on Joe's photo, of course. And this is another first. This is the first and only time that living figures have appeared on a US postage stamp. And there was such a clamor from the, the uh, American people and from Congress that the post office or whatever its official name was at the time broke its own rule and put living persons uh, on a postage stamp. And this stamp sold 131 million copies, which was a record for many, many years. And uh, this was at a time when postage stamps actually made money for the, U for the US government. Uh, this is um, a giant 100 ton bronze statue in Arlington, Virginia, based of course on Joe's photo. It's referred to as the Iwo Jima Memorial. In fact, it's the uh, US Marine Corps uh, War Memorial and it's magnificent. It cost $800,000. It was raised, uh, money was raised all from private sources. Man, many Marines and Marine veterans donated. And uh, in fact, I was told by the time of the Korean War, the end of the pay line, there'd be a sergeant there asking, asking strongly uh, for everybody to throw in a couple bucks for the Marine Corps. And uh, all those bucks uh, added up. This is absolutely spectacular monument. Uh, it's one of the five or six places in the US where uh, it's legislated that the US flag fly 24 hours a day. This is Mount Suribachi. If you were to see it today from an airplane, um, uh, after the war and the uh, tens of thousands of tons of bombs and uh, naval munitions we dropped on this island, uh, the trees have come back. This little zigzag you see is a road that the Seabees built uh, while the uh, uh, battle was still in progress. And right up here at the top, uh, we're next going to see what this little white spot is here. And uh, that's this uh, sort of aging monument that uh, I'm guessing the CBs built, but this is the spot where um, the flags were raised and where Joe took his famous picture. And I'll, I'll read this spot for you. It says 23 February, 1945, Old Glory was raised on the site by members of the 2nd Battalion, 28th Regiment, 5th Marine Division. Um, Iwo Jima, again, is not only a highly isolated place, um, the Japanese uh, do not want it to become a tourist attraction and you're only allowed to visit uh, once a year. If you are a Japanese or American civilian, you can attend this annual uh, memorial ceremony. Uh, it's a joint ceremony held by the Japanese and the Americans. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, American Air Force and Naval officers about to present a wreath at, um, uh, not at, not at the um, spot we just saw, but at a, um, a tribute spot. Here are three beautiful new Navy ships. And why are they in this presentation? Well, my group, the um, Joe Rosenthal chapter of the Marine Corps Combat Correspondence 
has been after the Navy to name a ship for Joe Rosenthal. And so this is my, this is my ship pitch. Um, we think Joe um, deserves this honor. He was uh, made four amphibious landings in the Pacific. Uh, Iwo Jima was his fourth and last. Uh, he, he faced the same dangers the Marines faced. Uh, he had his camera uh, as his only protection. They had their rifles, et cetera. So we have a petition. We have over 5,000 signatures so far. Um, you can sign a petition at, uh, at this website. And um, here's my info. Here's my uh, email address should you wish to um, speak with me with uh, questions, comments, stories about Joe, et cetera. So that, uh, that ends my presentation about three minutes late, which isn't bad and uh, look forward to your uh, questions. Well, thank you, Tom. That was amazing. And um, that was great. Oh, and by the way, you didn't start, you didn't, oh, you, you have more time. We started a few minutes late anyway, so you're, you're spot on. So I, I, I think you actually uh, ended a few minutes early. So that's a, that's a first, Craig, that's a first. So we can go and let, let's, um, I know we've got some questions, you know, it's fascinating. I noticed that, uh, that Joe had a, a, a Graflex camera. Um, That's right. You know, those were like famous press cameras in the day, but I mean, I, they're, they're heavy cameras. They, they are, um, they were the standard press camera actually into the sixties. Uh, even though, you know, 35 millimeter was, uh, invented perhaps in the thirties, um, uh, I spoke, I've spoken to older photographers said that they were still using them in the sixties and they were great for self-defense because they were so heavy and you could wrap your hand around it and swing it and people would get out of your way. The, the thing about them is um, they were very slow to operate. If, if you were really good, you could take a picture maybe every second and a half or two seconds. So Joe had uh, really one opportunity, one instant that he could take that photo and he took it. And I used, to, I used to describe that as lucky. And then I realized, you know, he had at that point um, 20 years, 30 years of luck. Um, so it was, you know, it was like a batter getting up and hitting a home run. Well, yeah, that was lucky, but you know, that, that batter put, put himself into that position with years and years of practice and, you know, hours and hours in, in a batting practice, et cetera. So Joe Rosenthal um, did the same thing. I, I noticed Joel oh, Panzer I has, uh, Joel Panzer has a, uh, one of the graphic graphics as it looks like. Uh huh. I don't see you get Joel. Tom, Tom Joel, may I ask you a question? Go ahead. Oh. Tom, I have two quick questions. First of all, I would like to thank you for a fascinating program this morning. Oh, two thank you. Questions are: Was Joe Rosenthal armed, or did he just carry his camera equipment? And the second one was: The three berms were they? naturally occurring geographic features or did the Japanese bulldoze those barriers up as a defense? Well, um, let me, let me ask, uh, answer number two, that those were naturally occurring uh, uh, terraces. Uh, for some reason, that's how the waves threw the sand up there. Uh, if the Japanese had done it, it would have been a darn good thing to do. They had, however, had about eight months of uh, preparations available. And they uh, built um, over 11 miles of tunnels, some uh, as long as deep as 100 feet. And you could, not quite, but practically move from one end of that island uh, to the other underground. And that's where their barracks were, their hospitals, their morgue, 
um, everything was underground. So no matter how much we bombed that island, it, it did very, very little damage to their um, prepared defenses. And that was all uh, because of Kurabayashi. He, he completely upended the Japanese defensive strategy, which, which had been meet the Marines on the beach and the first night have a bonsai charge and try to wipe them out. And he, he felt that that was a waste of his manpower. So he let the Marines land, he let them pile up and, and um, they, they landed with, without uh, too much opposing fire. But then within a couple of hours, uh, all hell broke loose on that beach. Joe did not have a weapon. Um, uh, correspondents were not allowed to carry weapons. Uh, so he had his, uh, his big press camera like Joel was holding. He had a smaller Roloflex camera. He had his film, um, et cetera. And, uh, but he was, uh, you know, in a Marine uniform, uh, helmet, et cetera. He was as much a target as any of the Marines on that island. And, and he was quoted as saying, um, he did not know how he got through that battle uh, without a scratch. He said it was like walking in the rain and not getting wet. That's how much steel and lead was uh, raining down on the Marines. Joel, do you want to say something about your camera? Joel, you're muted. You're muted, Joel. Oh, any other questions then? Yeah, we have a question from Anastasia. So, uh, Joel, why don't you go first, and then Anastasia? I just thought that people would like to see, get, get an idea. This is a small version of that. I think uh, this is speed graphic, and uh, it's quite heavy. <laughs> no. Carrying this, no. carrying this thing, and then there are the the film was just inserted in a little uh, holder in the back of the uh, unit. So you had to carry a bunch of kind of like uh, wooden uh, uh, film holders in order to take a picture, put it in, set everything up. It was not for, for uh, you had to be pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, 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 the speed of operating the camera uh, or the, the slow speed of operating the camera, I think can't be emphasized. That, that entire day of uh, Joe took the uh, flag raising photo, he took 18 photographs the entire day. And um, I'd say that was a pretty typical day for him on Iwo Jima. You know, if, if I, back when we had film, uh, if, if I had the unfortunate experience of going ashore on Iwo Jima, I would have had uh, maybe 50 rolls of film with me, you know, 36 frames each. He took 18 and a couple of, one came out to be the best photo ever taken. Um, it, uh, it was actually not Joe's favorite photo of uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, he had, a, his favorite was, a, was another one. It was similar in that it was kind of quiet but very powerful, but it was a Marine, a dead Marine lying in the sand and a second Marine running past him, still advancing. And uh, that was his favorite from Iwo and it's a very, very powerful photo. He called it the quick and the dead. And unfortunately that was a scene that was replayed over and over uh, 6,821 Marines, um, Bill mentioned was the Marines uh, dead on Iwo Jima. It was the, the highest of uh, uh, Marine casualties in the Pacific. And it was the only time uh, dead, wounded, missing. It's the only time American um, 
casualties exceeded the enemy's casualties. There were 70,000 Marines uh, versus, uh, no one's quite sure, um, 20 to 22,000 Japanese uh, defenders. Uh, approximately 1,000 Japanese were captured. The rest were killed or um, buried in the island. You know, they were in caves, which we uh, exploded the entrances of and, and entombed them there. So the Japanese considered that island uh, basically a cemetery. And they have an ongoing effort, as we do, but not to the same, same extent, to uh, investigate those caves and tunnels and um, repatriate uh, the remains of their, their soldiers. I believe Anastasia has a, a question. Yes, Tom, uh, beautiful presentation. Thank you. I am, I'm, I'm very curious about the photographers, war photographers to begin with. Obviously, someone else took a picture of Rosenthal. Yes. So it, what typically, how many photographers would there be for an invasion like this? Can you give us a sense for how many were out there? And, you know, with this, some of this other dialogue, especially Joel showing the camera, I have a better understanding with what, how the film worked. Sure. Um, and, uh, but I'm just like, what's, what's it like to be a photographer and how many are there typically? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I'll answer it in a second. But I'm currently uh, curating an exhibit that will be uh, opening in September in Sacramento on Joe Rosenthal and um, on Joe Rosenthal and his work, Iwo Jima, but we're also devoting a, a significant amount of the exhibit to uh, other combat journalists, both photographers and uh, reporters. And your answer is, Anastasia, uh, more than you think. The, the Marine Corps alone had 40 uh, photographers and cameramen on Iwo Jima. The Army had some, even though it wasn't an Army operation. The Navy and the Coast Guard had some. Uh, Joe Rosenthal was working for the Associated Press. He was not the only Associated Press reporter there. And, uh, you know, this was, of course, a time before TV. Everything was in radio or, or newspapers or magazines. And you can imagine um, the significant newspapers of the time and magazines of the time had uh, reporters and photographers there. And there were radio correspondents there. So I would guess in total, certainly over a hundred, uh, it might be significantly more than that. But Robert Sherrod was kind of the Walter Cronkite of the day. He was a correspondent for uh, Time Life. W. Eugene Smith is one of the greatest uh, photojournalists of the 20th century. He was there photographing for Life Magazine and um, uh, you know, again, all the all this, you know, large, significant um, newspapers and magazines uh, would have correspondence there. Some of them, especially the reporters, were able to, if they wanted to, um, stay on the stay aboard the ships and uh, get the their press releases and info from the Navy and the Marine Corps and write up their dispatches and send them back. They never had to get their feet wet. Um, Joe slept on the ship at night. Every morning he would uh, get a ride on a landing craft into the beach. He'd have an idea what he was gonna do that day, where he was gonna go, which units he was gonna follow. And then at the end of the day, he would take a a landing craft back to the ship, write up his captions, prepare his film uh, to be sent out. And the film was sent out, a uh, film from all the photographers who were there, civilian or military. It was flown each night to Guam 
where there was a um, gang dark room, all the film was processed together and then sent back out to whoever it belonged to. The Associated Press would have a photo editor there, the Marine Corps would, et cetera. So um, Joe was able to, you know, sleep in, in with certain security. He could get a shower, he could get some nice uh, Navy chow, but then the next morning he'd be back on the, on the island with the Marines. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, an opportunity for one more question before we end the recording. I see sure. Bill Buchanan's hands up. So Bill, why don't you ask the last question and then um, we'll end the recording and then following that, we'll keep the room open until around nine o'clock. All right, so if you have some further questions, we can we can circle back around. Um, Bill? Yeah, thanks, uh, President Craig. Um, great presentation, Tom. Uh, when I went back to the uh, reunion of honor about 10 years ago and uh, <clears throat> took a tour of the island from the beaches that you mentioned, the assault beaches up to the top of Mount Suribachi. And by the way, <laughs> came back with uh, some of the uh, black sand and I made it up into little uh, glass uh, uh, jars with the help of Claire, and we sent it out to about 30 Marine veterans here. And <laughs> that was quite well received. Uh, anyway, great presentation. And I just wondered, uh, can you give us uh, some uh, of your own uh, bio, your own background, and how you got into photography and, how, and what experience you had with the Marine Corps? Well, uh, <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Let's see, I'm not a Marine. I do, um, I do appreciate the Marine coffee mugs. They seem to you know, have the best coffee mugs around. Um, I would like to talk with you, Bill, at some point and hear about your dad. I actually um, had the opportunity to, to meet a number of the 4th Marine Division veterans, uh, including a man I know you know, um, Lieutenant General Larry Snowden who um, put together those reunions of honor. Um, uh, I had the opportunity in 2009, I believe, to attend the 4th Marine Division Association reunion in Reno. And I was uh, their photographer that year. But I've been a photographer since around uh, age 10 uh, I always knew that's what I wanted to do when I grew up, uh, although I didn't at first have the courage really to do that versus something more um, conventional like lawyer or teacher or something like that. Um, I've always been interested in World War II. My dad was a veteran. He served in Europe. And he, like many of the World War II vets and many vets, uh, did not talk about his experiences. And I think because he did not, the more he did not talk about it, the more I was interested. So I, I always had um, this interest. And um, about 20 years ago, 21, 22 years ago now, actually, a um, co colleague of mine in a writers and photographers group in San Francisco was a, a Marine aviator from Vietnam. And he belonged to the group I belong to now, the Joe Rosenthal chapter of the Combat Correspondence. And he invited me to their meetings to, to meet Rosenthal. He said, boy, if you're a photographer, you gotta meet Joe Rosenthal. I said, yes, I agree. So, um, Joe was not attending every monthly meeting because of his health. I could not attend every monthly meeting because I was still working. And so we kept missing each other, but I got to know the others in the group of which there were many at the time and most of them were World War II veterans. And I decided I'd like to share their, really their personalities and their stories with other people so I began interviewing them and photographing them. And that was 21 years ago. And now I've interviewed uh, about 300 uh, veterans and photographed them. Um, I published a book a few years ago on the Japanese American veterans 
who uh, fought for the U.S. while their families were locked up in the, the internment camps. And um, so that was doing a book is, is a big deal. It's a tremendous time commitment, and I don't recommend it to anybody. Um, but it was the greatest, is the greatest thing I've ever done. And um, very, very glad I did it. And that kind of set me on this course with uh, uh, trying to honor the veterans and tell their stories. And, and um, so far, I'm, I'm sticking to the course. Thank you very much. And I, I presume that we're going to get a link to your presentation in Sacramento uh, uh, in September of, uh, of this I'll, year. I'll be sure. Um, I'll be sure you get the info. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Well, thank you, Tom. And um, let's just take a moment. We're going to, I'll keep the room open. And I know there's more questions, but we're going to need to stop the recording because we're going to have people leaving the room here. It's getting close to the top of the hour. And um, I just wanted to, uh, to say thank you, Tom, again, for joining us. That was a great presentation. Thank you all. Appreciate it. And uh, you're welcome to come back anytime. And um, actually, I'm really interested on your book on the Japanese internment camps. And Michael Sarah was talking about that, too. So I have a book on Manzanar at my house. And it's just like, what a, what a, what a, what a, you know, it's a horrible chapter in American history, but it's, it's, it's wonderful that people are aware of it and that, you know, that, you know, you've, you guys are writing books and that it's still, you know, it's part of our history. It's part of who we are. Very and, much. Uh, you know, the Japanese people have been so strong and just rebounding from that tragedy. So that just, is it the, the samurai spirit coming out? So, That's um, right. yeah, Michael, you can second me on that one. Yes. Excellent. Me, well, well, hold on, Christine. I'm just well, so I'm going to turn off the recording. Um, and uh, by the way, next week we have Candy Campbell that's going to be channeling the energy of Florence Nightingale. So if you haven't had a chance to see Candy, then you know join us next week. Following that, we have Kate Atkin. Uh, Kate is uh, uh, has been introduced by Derek Arden. She's going to be talking about the imposter syndrome. And then the following week, we have Antonio White, the pitch freak, is on the calendar. Are we still on the calendar, Tony? Antonio? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Excellent. You want to say anything about that? Don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. You heard it here first. Antonio is like the E.F. Hutton of the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. When he speaks, you listen. All right. Well, again, thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording here, and we'll keep the room open for a little while. I know we have great, great, uh, some more questions. Can you stick around for a few more minutes, Tom? I'd be delighted. Sure. All right. Thank you.